Imagine that Ukraine did not get invaded by Russia this February. Instead, Poland took its place. Of course, that's not realistic in the modern-day geopolitical environment, but just to explore the course of such a hypothetical war, how would have Poland fared if it had to face the same Russian force, relying not on full NATO help, but only on the amount of help Ukraine got so far? Would the war still go on for a year? Watch our video to find out. Speaking of hypothetical wars, now you can start one yourself in Conflict of Nations, a game sponsoring this video. It's a free online PvP strategy game where you get to choose which real-world country you want to lead, decide who to attack and who to ally with, but beware there are up to 127 other players doing the same. Everything is played out in real time. What I really like about the game is how it allows players to implement their own long-term strategies and see how they pay off in the long run. Some matches can take weeks to complete. It makes taking command of a modern-day battlefield all the more convincing. And new players will get an exclusive gift. Click on the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription. Choose your country and take the world by storm. At the start of the real war, differences between the Polish and Ukrainian military were considerable. Polish armed forces are smaller in personnel numbers, being basically just half the size. Both the Ukraine's National Guard and Poland's Territorial Army are volunteer-based military organizations. Let's also look at what Russia had attacked with and what it would initially use on Poland in this hypothetical scenario. Throughout this video we will compare Polish forces with Ukrainian ones as well to show where Poland might fare worse than Ukraine if attacked by Russia. While Russia had many other areas around the world to keep manned, one area which would still be manned but would be used in a war with Poland would be Kaliningrad. Russia there maintains a fair number of ground troops. While not all of those would necessarily leave Kaliningrad, they would likely get counterattacked themselves or provide artillery firepower. Of course, Russia would likely not enjoy some of additional manpower it used in Ukraine. The Donbass militia, while not well equipped, would still represent a net loss. It's also plausible Russia would have to keep at least some of the professional units near Ukraine and on Crimea, thus potentially the Kaliningrad troop addition would be compensated for. The attack itself, of course, would be much different, in part due to geography and in part due to politics. When it devised plans for attack on Ukraine, Russia initially thought it would not meet organized resistance, that it could rush through the country and seize key points. Due to obvious historical and cultural factors in play, such a plan would not be even attempted with Poland. Instead, a more ordinary and more careful push over the border would be attempted. That means slower initial progression. Crucially, Ukraine was attacked by Russia from three sides, as its territory wrapped around much of Ukraine. With Poland, even when full border of Belarus would be used, Polish exposure to the Russian attack would be more confined. A front line with Poland would initially be three times shorter. Now, a shorter front line is generally easier to defend. Attacks are usually done so a great force is concentrated on just a few small parts of the front, like it was in Ukraine, where there were several pushes into the country during the initial week. Such pushes, when successful, tend to break the enemy lines and melt into larger, wider movements of the whole front. One can observe that large swaths of the Ukrainian border were not under direct attack initially. Even Russia could not muster enough forces for that. But given that all the Russian forces would be concentrated on a smaller front, that would also mean most of the eastern Polish borders would be under Russian pressure from day one. Ukraine started partial mobilization a day before the Russian attack. Full mobilization started almost a day after the attack began. With Poland, mobilization might start earlier. Russia would likely want to substantially increase its numbers in Kaliningrad. Since that region is not even bordering Belarus and large-scale exercises have not been done there in the past compared to exercises near Ukrainian border, it's likely such vast movements of manpower would cause even greater alert to Poland. The alternative for Russia would be not strengthening Kaliningrad beforehand, but that would probably be deemed way too risky and not worth it. 
Geography-wise, Poland is similar to Ukraine in the sense that it is largely flat. Only in the far south does it have some mountains, which would impede the movement of large army formations. It does have more forested areas, almost double. When it comes to urbanized areas, which would also impede large motorized army formations, Poland again shows greater density of such areas. Though this area in the northeast is fairly light on urbanized areas, that area also happens to be just south of Kaliningrad and west of Belarus. Rivers and other water features, as on any battlefield, would also channel Russian movements. The wider a river is, the harder it is to cross it in a war. In Poland, only the Vista River running through the middle of the country is a really big obstacle. There are of course other smaller rivers and canals, which would also impede movement, but as they are narrower, a bigger number of crossing points could be constructed over them. It's thus likely Russian initial attack would be channeled into these areas. Forests and lakes would also cause trouble for the attacker. Poland would likely keep the Russians at bay near the northwestern border with Kaliningrad. While Poland might be tempted to even rush into Kaliningrad near that area, it's doubtful such a move would be beneficial. Attacks would use up a lot of armor and manpower, while in the grand scheme of things, even if Poland managed to take part of Kaliningrad, it would be at a too great of a cost. Somewhat earlier mobilization than Ukraine's would help Poland keep up with the Russian onslaught initially. Within the first two weeks, Ukraine had some 100,000 volunteers join the armed forces. Without Crimea and Donbass, its population is very similar to Polish one, so assuming all other factors are similar, there is little reason why Poland could not mobilize as many troops in a similar time frame. Even if morale is hand-waved as impossible to quantify, pure numbers are still just part of the capability. Equipment and experience play a role as well. Ukrainian forces had more actual war experience, as over 200,000 personnel participated in battles of 2014. Poland had very little actual combat experience. A smaller number of its troops participated in Iraq and Afghanistan in surroundings of lesser intensity. But Polish army generally trains more often than Ukrainian army and performs more exercises with larger combined arms units. The Polish army of February 2022 would be fairly well equipped. In pure numbers less so than Ukraine, but in capability levels it would be ahead, roughly matching the Russian equipment. Capability levels here are only roughly noted. As one can tell, Ukraine had roughly double the number of tanks around February 2022. That difference means that Poland against Russia would do somewhat worse than Ukraine. Russian thrust would also be dampened by various infantry-operated anti-tank missiles. Given that Ukraine had some advanced missiles sent to it even before Russia attacked, initial figures would again mean Poland might fare slightly worse against Russia than Ukraine did. When it comes to infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers, Poland is not much better off. Its vast numbers of BMP vehicles are far from modern. Ukrainian BMP vehicles could be labeled a bit more capable. Poland does operate several hundred of quite modern Patria IFVs though. With their modern anti-tank missiles and decent optics, they would be a greater threat to Russians than any Ukrainian similar vehicle was. Poland, however, falls behind Ukraine in the number of ordinary lightly armed armored personnel carriers. When it comes to artillery, Poland is again showing smaller numbers, even without counting a few hundred Ukrainian Todd artillery pieces, which are a category that Poland lacks completely. Multiple rocket launchers are also less numerous. Poland completely lacks large caliber long-range rocket systems. Number and type of attack helicopters is slightly favoring Ukraine. Air defenses wise, both Ukraine and Poland use old Soviet systems, with Ukraine at least enjoying the benefit of some S-300 systems, while most potent long-range Polish ones are a generation older. Mid-range SAMs are also more modern in Ukrainian case, as Polish Kubs are vastly outdated. However, the more complex systems are, the greater likelihood there is that some of these nominally listed systems were not truly available for Ukraine, especially the S-300 figures might be suspect. Poland would likely fare a tad better in very short-range systems, partially due to more OSA batteries, but generally due to its own shoulder-launched missiles, which are quite modern and potent, 
battering most of Ukrainian inventory of similar weapons. Ukraine again had a larger number of combat planes on paper, but it's possible not all were really operational. Furthermore, even the Polish MiGs are somewhat more modern than Ukrainian ones, and F-16s are easily a generation ahead of anything Ukraine had. Plus, unlike Ukraine, which had a fairly small number of Soviet-era guided weapons, Polish armed forces have a somewhat larger stock of those. Those stocks might last a few weeks longer. Polish anti-ship missiles are also quite modern, with a secondary land attack capability due to their GPS guidance option. Coupled with the air-launched missiles, Polish long-range options against Russia would be an order of magnitude greater than Ukrainian were at the start of the war. Ukraine could only rely on a limited number of Tochka ballistic missiles of short range and poor accuracy. Due to the fairly small Russian Baltic fleet, it's unlikely Russia would even attempt to threaten the Polish coastline. There would be too little to gain and far too many sailor lives to lose. Now, just as with Ukraine against Russia, the number of fighters would be insufficient to really defeat the attacker's air force. But for as long as those Polish fighters could survive on the ground, Russia would have greater problems and more severe losses in the air. Polish planes could engage Russian ones from greater distances than Ukrainian planes managed. Of course, just as in Ukraine, Russia would try to prevent those planes from even taking off. But again, as we saw in reality, that didn't really work flawlessly. NATO did warn Ukraine and it would warn Poland in our scenario too, so early dispersal of Polish planes would be assured. While Poland is smaller than Ukraine and therefore a bit easier to cover, Russia also benefited from a better distribution of bases around Ukraine. With Poland, there would be a similar depth of territory available to the Poles, considering Russia would be flying from just one direction. Also, precisely due to that and having to mostly rely on Belarus air bases, Russia might even have fewer air bases in range and fewer planes ready in the opening stages of the war, compared to what it had in Ukraine. Enough so that even with the Ukrainian Agen SAM systems, Russia might have fewer successful airstrikes performed deep inside Poland with higher air losses, compared to Ukraine. Ukraine had more drones at the start of the war, though majority of theirs were really small ones of limited capability. Polish drones are slightly more potent than those, but Poland lacks medium-sized drones like the Bayraktar completely. First such drones are yet to arrive in Poland. However, Poland does have some loitering munitions, basically kamikaze drones, with a bit stronger punch than the famous small switchblade drones used in Ukraine. Again, we have to mention that the scenario stipulates similar amount of help for Poland as Ukraine got. So once the war starts, all those thousands of additional guided anti-tank missiles and tens of thousands of unguided ones would start arriving in Poland, as well as thousands of manpad class anti-air missiles, various vehicles and so on. Even with this scenario disregarding the reality of Poland being part of NATO, it's plausible Poland would be getting more modern NATO standard weapons and getting them more quickly than Ukraine did. That's because Poland already operates NATO equipment, such as Leopard 2 tanks and some NATO compatible artillery. Poland would likely be able to receive and utilize even the more advanced systems like AMRAAM missiles or GPS guided artillery rounds earlier. Ukraine famously got so low on Soviet caliber artillery rounds at one point that a big part of its artillery inventory was nearly useless. While Poland too uses mostly Soviet rounds, it would have 80 NATO caliber self-propelled howitzers to count on for precision strikes. Of course, Russia would be gradually taking those out, similar to what it is doing in Ukraine. All the numbers on both sides would suffer. And pretty much the same thing would happen again. Russia would find itself gravely deprived of enough manpower while Poland would find itself stripped of heavy vehicles and firepower after several months of combat. Due to greater initial concentration of ground forces and a more careful approach, Russia would be likely to lose less men initially, but also take less Polish territory compared to Ukraine. Still, it would likely manage to approach Warsaw, and unlike in Ukraine, it would have a much straighter, more consolidated frontline so it would not likely decide to abandon the taken territory so easily, as Russia did in north of Ukraine. 
it's plausible the front would, just as in Ukraine, settle eventually with very little chances of big movement, possibly around these lines, with the only question being just how much progress could Russia do from the western Kaliningrad. In that protracted war of attrition, however, Russia might do even somewhat worse than it is doing in Ukraine. As said, Poland would be mobilizing just as many troops as Ukraine. But Russia would be lacking Donbas regions as a well of mobilization. Not only the initial 30,000 troops, but possibly 100 or more thousand additional troops that Russia mobilized there. Since Donbas republics aren't part of Russia, Putin freely ordered mass mobilization there for Ukraine. For Poland, that would not be possible. It's possible that six months into the war, even with lower initial casualties, Russia would find itself with an army one-third smaller, facing a Polish force that would be just as numerous as Ukrainian one is today. It's also plausible that fewer Russian troops would see an attack on Poland as righteous as an attack on Ukraine, due to less historical animosity and fewer historical ties. That might push morale even lower. As a reminder, there would likely be fewer successful Russian deep airstrikes, and Poland would enjoy more long-range precision attacks behind Russian front lines, enabled by robust NATO intelligence help, just like today in Ukraine. Eventually, the disparity in numbers would likely take its toll, and Russian advances would stop completely, earlier than they did in Ukraine. From then on, it would be the long game, a year after the war started, or two years, if modeled on future Ukraine actions, NATO might or might not keep sending heavy arms into Poland. So far into the future, who knows how the Polish army would transform. Certainly after a year or more of fighting, even those initially green mobilized troops would be quite battle-hardened. Poland is also several times richer, which would mean it would be able to buy more weapons right from the start, rather than wait for NATO aid. Indeed, one of our recent videos dealt with precisely that, the recent Polish arms shopping spree. So the vast advantage in manpower, coupled with added NATO weaponry, might mean Poland would eventually be able to drive the Russians out of its country. However, such long-term predictions could cut both ways. What if Putin orders mass mobilization in Russia, precisely because Russia would fare worse in Poland? If somehow that manages to go through without mass civil resistance, then who knows what would really happen. Maybe Russia would push back into Poland and be more successful. Would be stretching the no direct NATO involvement rule to its limits. And if mass Russian mobilization doesn't happen, a big loss of Russian army power as they're pushed out of Poland means there is a greater chance for tactical nuclear weapons use, which sadly isn't confined just to this hypothetical scenario. It is also relevant to the real-world future situation in Ukraine. A few more words on Conflict of Nations. The game is truly grand in every sense. You can grow your army with tanks, jets, attack helicopters and many other unit types. Don't forget creating long-lasting alliances with other players. A military research tree features over 250 different items, so you'll have plenty of choices. You can even decide between various game modes that all come with detailed maps. Finally, if you want to opt for weapons of mass destruction, you'll get to see how its use affects the population, morale and economy. Overall, your tactics and strategies have all long-term consequences, which makes the game especially immersive. Also, you will get an exclusive gift. Click on the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is available for 30 days only, so don't lose time. Pick your country and go rule the world. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.